Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. We are happy and delighted to see you this morning. Let's start our worship off with singing. If you're able to stand, let's stand with us this morning as we sing Rising. From the rising of the sun till the sun goes down, let the name of the Lord be praised. From the rising of the sun till the sun goes down, let the name of the Lord be praised. We're gathered to worship, becoming a choir to sing your praise. this morning just a couple brief announcements um i tell you last night the rain was just too little but i had prepared i thought well if it's going to rain today we're surely not going to be able to move the stuff out of the storage un- uh, cages into the storage units and then it came and it stopped raining and so we'll still do that we'll try and do that as briefly as possible um i brought shorts i'm ready to go so i'll just meet you in the gym and then we'll take care of that if you're able to help after um i want you to know that next week is the first sunday of the month and so we'll be celebrating communion we take up a benevolent offering and i always forget to do this but i remember today ever since the pandemic we tried to collect canned food 
uh, for we care. And so if you could bring some canned food items, preferably something that would cover a meal for people instead of a can of garbanzo beans, even if you like them, you know. I mean, dinty more beef stew would go a longer way and be much more enjoyable than, you know, pork and beans or something else like that. So don't just clear out your cabinets. Bring something substantial. And then Rocky will take that over to We Care because there's always a need. Um, during prayer time, please remember to keep the Bocock and Marshall families in your prayers as they face their challenges within that family. And let's ask the Lord to bless this service, shall we? Father, we give you thanks and praise. We do want to lift up high the name of Jesus. We do want to praise his name today and ask that your spirit will fall upon us so that we'll be able to accomplish this goal. What an honor, what a privilege it is to be able to gather here today to worship him. So we ask for your blessing upon this service, and may all that is done be for his honor and glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing together, this is amazing grace.
hand, you may have a seat this morning. Scripture today is from the book of Psalms, chapter 37. We'll be reading verses 3 through 6. Let's declare the word together. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. to EA News. Coming up, a new pastoral training program with exciting new instructors, a first-time dental team that provided brigades in several of our local communities, students spending a week in the mountain, and an update on teams and team projects from this first quarter of 2023. All this and more right after this. like to spend a week up the mountain? Well, this is exactly what a group of young college-age women did. EA recently partnered with a group of young women from the Leadership Center, a Honduran ministry that trains young women to be Christian leaders in community development. These second-year students stayed up in our mountain communities for a week, 
and they worked on projects that included building a much needed fence around the school, teaching finance classes in English, and more. It was a wonderful collaboration led by our very own Leadership Center graduate, Odalis. Supporting our local churches is one of our passions here at EA. And because of that, two very special events have already happened this year. Number one, we have officially begun our second three-year Pathways Pastoral Training Program, led by Pastor Don Erickson from the Chicago area. This program equips pastors with a knowledge of how to better study, teach, and preach the Bible. What is extra special about this new program is that two of the pastors who graduated from our first session of the program are now the ones teaching this new class of local pastors. Number two, in March, more than 200 youth attended a youth conference here at EA. The conference included worship, three breakout sessions with guest speakers, food, and a final joint service with everyone coming back together as one. We used this year's theme of We Proclaim Him and taught on how to practice this in all areas of life. People were blessed and lives were changed. In the clinic, we had a special visit from a new dental team that's who partnered with the clinic to do multiple brigades and clinic work during their week with us. Hundreds of patients benefited from the group skills and our clinic staff loved having the visiting brigade. We also had the blessing of having two visiting specialists in the first quarter of this year. Dr. Jeff, an ophthalmologist, and Dr. Randy, a pediatrician, came to serve in our clinic and blessed many patients. Okay, let's talk teams and community outreach. This year, we have already hosted two weddings with a total of three couples getting married. Thanks to our teams and staff, these couples were able to have the wedding of their dreams and take this step of obedience before God and family. Who of our viewers likes music? I know I do. Music is a special gift from God and our music maestra Sheila came down for a few weeks to teach classes for students, churches, and a special course of xylophone classes to a group of local kids. This is such a special way to support church worship ministries, teach kids and adults about music, and emphasize the importance of worship. In our learning center, we have over 165 students enrolled in this year's scholarship program. Each student has received a backpack, school supplies, uniforms, and everything else needed for this school year. And thanks to our special speaker, Amy Patterson, 34 youth leaders attended a special conference in our learning center on how to disciple youth, a much needed skill for those working in youth ministry. So much more has already happened this year including having multiple volunteers, Denton donations arriving, tutoring and special classes being held, board meetings, new staff, VBS programs, church night programs, a children's Bible club, many wonderful team projects, and more. Thank you for being a part of all that is happening here in Honduras. For more information or to find out how you can get involved, Visit us at eahonduras.org or on Facebook and Instagram by searching EA Honduras. Did you see that before? No? There's a lot going on. Our representative, our missionary, for uh, EA is Denise Hodge, and uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on down there, and so we're excited about that. Okay, so I'm letting you know that I can't wait to be up here. <laughs> so, I, you know, I, we should be done by about 1230, so just be patient. No amens, huh? Oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Look, we've been looking at Titus uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10 for a number of weeks. And just as a brief review, um, in this passage, Paul has been instructing Titus to set certain things in order. 
And he addresses five different groups that must be addressed according to sound doctrine. He talks about older men, older women, younger women, younger men, and slaves. And out of these five groups, Titus is going to directly instruct four out of those five. He's going to instruct older men, older women, younger men, and slaves. But he's leaving the instruction of younger women uh, up to the responsibility of older women. In regard to the older men, he was to address six areas of focus. In regard to older women, there were four areas of focus. In regard to slaves, there were five. But when it comes to the responsibility of what he was to instruct the younger men, there was only one. Verse 6 mentions this. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Now, I know I sound like a broken record, but that's okay. That's what I want to sound like. Being self-controlled has to do with not being uh, extreme in behavior, of curbing one's desires and impulses. It has to do with being careful and sensible while exercising sound judgment. Now, in the first 22 verses of this letter, which brings us to chapter 2, verse 6, self-control is mentioned at least four times in regard to elders and older men and older women and younger men, which leads me to believe that it is a part of God's will that all of his people, all those who are in Christ, should be self-controlled, right? So this morning I want to address two verses in this passage that I purposely skipped last week. Uh, they don't address what was to be taught to the five groups. Rather, it, it deals with the method that Titus is to use when he's urging the younger men to be self-controlled. Now, let me also explain, while these are directions that are given within the context of younger men, this would apply to any teaching that Titus is going to do in Crete. So while it will pertain to younger men, it also pertains to all of us. Older men, older women, younger women. These things are important. Now the NIV translates these two verses in this fashion, verses 7 and 8. It says, And everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. And because I'm going to be referring from time to time to the New American Standards translation, this is how these verses are translated. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds, with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Now, when we looked at older men and when we looked at older women, I mentioned that these two groups were examples for society, examples for the church. People looked up to them. They appreciated them much more than we do the elderly in our society. And when we come to younger men, it's not the younger men who are to set an example. It's Titus. He's to set an example for the younger men to follow. In other words, he's to urge, he's to exhort the younger men to be self control by example. Not just in word, not just in instruction, but in deed as well. Now, both of these translations emphasize the importance of being an example in everything, in all things. Titus was to be setting an example for the younger men to follow. Why was Titus to be an example? Why not the older men? Weren't the older men to be an example? I just said they were. Of course they were. But one of the things that Titus was to teach them was to be self-control. So why Titus? Why would Paul be telling Titus to be an example? Now, I, I had to think about this for a while. I had to wrestle with this for a while, and I came to the conclusion that there are some people... There are just some people who have inroads into other people's lives that some may not have. 
For example, I remember I used to teach in my former church a group of teenagers, and we were talking about dating. My son was right on the cusp of of being at that age. And so I was uh, teaching a class on how weird our dating system is here in the United States. I mean, guys hang out with girls, girls hang out with guys, they develop a relationship, they start getting closer together. And I know I'm going to use terms that are antiquated, but I don't know how else to describe it. At one point, they decide not to go out with anybody else. So I don't know if that's properly called going steady or being exclusive or whatever it is, whatever that term is, they don't go and hang out with anybody else. And then after a while, things go sour and they just say, oh, well, let's just break up. Let's go back to dating others, and they repeat the process over and over and over again. And I just shared with them what we do then in our dating system as we groom our young people when things get a little tough in relationships, let's just throw in the towel. And then we wonder why divorce is over 50% in our country. These two sisters during this class, they, they had laughed at me. And they said, Pastor, do you really believe that? And I said, of course I did. Otherwise, I wouldn't mention that to you. Do you you share that with your son? I said, of course I do. And they just laughed it off and said, okay, you know, then whatever. My son went to a youth group in a neighboring church. And during that time, they were talking about dating. And guess what the youth pastor talked about? He talked about how weird our dating system is here in the United States and how we do not groom relationships that work through the difficult times but to throw in the towel. And he came back and he was telling me all these things like he's never heard that before. And I'm scratching my, my, scratching my head and saying, you know, what gives? But something connected with him. Perhaps it was the age of the youth pastor, you know. Maybe it was, you know, he was closer in age to my son than I was. In all things, Titus was to be an example of doing what is good, according to the NIV. I think that's why Paul said, hey, look it, you need to be example to these younger men. After all, he was much closer in age than the older men. He was one of them. In all things, Titus was to be an example. The verse literally reads, an example of good works. Now, the word that is translated deeds in the NIV is the same word that we find in Ephesians 2.10, which reads, we, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's the same word that's found in James 2.14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? It's the same word that is found in James 2.20 that says, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? You cannot be in Christ and not do good works. You're God's workmanship. As God's workmanship, you will do good works because that's what God has created us to do. Good works are the same thing as bearing fruit. Those who are in Christ will bear fruit. Now, I suggest to you that bearing fruit or doing good works gives evidence that one is self-controlled. You see, if one is extreme in behavior, if one does not curb their desires or impulses, doing what is good is going to be very, very, very difficult. If anyone is not sensible, if anyone does not exercise sound judgment, then one is going to have extreme difficulty bearing fruit. And so for Titus to be successful in his effort to urge or to exhort the younger men to be self-controlled, he needed to be an example of one who does just that, one who bears fruit. 
He needs to show them that not only can it be done, he needs, by example, to show them how to do it so that they too can bear fruit by being self-controlled. Now, throughout this message, you've heard me say that all of us are teachers, right? I mean, by how we live, we are all teaching others something through what we say and through what we do. And so, Paul understood this as well. And notice that Titus is going to be teaching by example. He states, in your teaching, show integrity. Show integrity or absence of corruption, which is what the word integrity means. It has to do with being pure as far as doctrine is concerned, which just makes sense, right, in light of verse 1, which said, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. In addition, his teaching must show seriousness. When I think of seriousness... I have a tendency to think, think along the lines of a lack of playfulness or a lack of having fun or joking around, but that's not what this word means. Rather, it has to do with the characteristic of a thing or a person which entitles that thing or a person to reverence or to respect. Titus's actions and words were to be in accord with doctrine, and it should reflect a character that one can clearly see has been transformed by God. That's why the NIV calls it being dignified. There's an element of holiness, reverence, and respect to it. And finally, Paul mentions soundness of speech. In other words, his teaching and his actions do not deviate from the truth. It's sound. It's solid. Now, let me try and tie all this together in and, and, uh, as understandable a way as I possibly can. And the first thing that I want to emphasize is the balance that we find in verses 6 through 8. You cannot be self-controlled and not have a balanced life. What is balance? Well, there's a balance between word and action, right? Notice carefully in this passage how the action part comes first. Because the first part of verse 7 says, in all things show yourselves to be an example of good deeds. How do you show it? By what you say? No, by what you do. By what you do. Titus is to show himself to be something. That something is an example. And he is to do this in all things. Do you see that? In all things. In other words, he's to be an example of balance in all parts of life, whether it's work, whether it's play, whether it's study, whether it's service, however you choose to divide it. Titus is to be a living example of one who is bearing the fruit of good deeds. Show them, show them. Before we look at the word aspect, I need to point out to you just how much Titus's actions are in sharp contrast with those individuals mentioned in verse 10 of chapter 1, those individuals Paul calls a rebellious people. How do you know? How do you know they're rebellious? You could tell by their actions. Their actions show that they don't submit to authority. Their actions show that they're disobedient. Their actions are defiant and uncooperative. They do not fall in line with the lordship of God. Therefore, rebellious people will never, never, never bear the fruit of good works. Titus's actions are an example of the exact opposite of what rebellious people are like. And that, my friends, is what the younger men need to see. They need to see that in his life. 
in balance with action must be words. What Titus teaches verbally must be in accordance with sound doctrine. It must remain pure. It must re remain dignified. It must not deviate from truth. I wish, I wish we were like that today. Notice again the contrast between this and the rebellious people that are mentioned in chapter 1, verse 10. Those who are described as being mere talkers. Those who are described as deceivers. Their talk is empty. It's powerless. It does not refer to truth. It's not fruitful. It's not redeeming. In other words, it's never going to point anybody to Christ in a saving way. It's not pure, nor is it dignified. They are deceivers, they're called, because they are teaching what is not true. Again, let me point out how important balance is. Actions must be in balance with your verbal declarations. And your verbal declarations must be in balance. They must be supported by your actions. Again, let me point out to you that what is present first is actions, is actions. Titus was to set an example by how he lived. Is there any significance to this observation that actions came first before word, or is this just coincidence? Well, I'll leave that up to you to decide, but consider this. If Paul and Timothy spent any time in Crete, it was limited at best. What that means is, is when Titus was left behind to straighten things out that was unfinished, when he was left behind to appoint elders in every city, he did not have a long-standing relationship with the church or the community. He wasn't a citizen. He was an outsider. He was a newcomer. He was not a local. Yes, he had, rep he had responsibilities that he needed to carry out. Yes, he was empowered to carry out the task that was entrusted to him, but he had no track record with anybody. Under such circumstances, it seems actions speak louder than words. But that does not eliminate the need for words. Because actions bridge gaps, they establish credibility, they develop relationships, and they help eliminate mistrust and resistance. Verbal teaching may have fit when it came to older men, it may have fit when it came to older women, but when it came to his peers, their natural reaction could have been, who are you to preach to us? You're just like us. If the intended outcome was to exhort or to urge the younger men to be self-controlled, it seems the most effective way that he was going to be able to achieve that goal was to show them by action what that looks like in real time. And then, by showing them, it would make his verbal instruction way more appealing. Way more appealing. This methodology will most certainly add credibility to his instruction to the various groups that were mentioned in this passage. But <laughs> it will not guarantee that Titus isn't going to face any kind of opposition as he carries out these responsibilities. You know, there's always going to be naysayers. There'll always be those individuals that are skeptical, right? There'll always be those individuals that will try and pick apart what you say and what you do. There'll always be those individuals. Still, why Titus is increased, he's, is in Crete, he should take care of everything. He should 
present himself as an example of one who does what is good, as one who bears the fruit of good works for the glory of God. He should make sure that his instruction is in accordance with sound doctrine, that it is always pure, that it is always true, and that it never, never, never deviates from the truth. What a responsibility! He's to employ this methodology so that he cannot be condemned in any way. So that no one will be able to make any accusation against him that his words and his actions are unfit to follow, that they're in error, that he needs to be censored. And then Paul elaborates this, on this a little bit further in the remaining part of verse 8. So that those who oppose you, and they will, may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Notice again, Paul does not say that if someone opposes you, they may be ashamed. The wording seems to indicate that there will indeed be those who oppose you. Opposition can be carried out in a number of different ways. But one of the first or the primary ways that opposition winds up being carried out is typically through speech, typically through accusations, whether they're true or whether they are not. And in this case, the opposition will have no basis for accusations. They'll have nothing bad that they can possibly say, or a better word would actually be evil. They'll have nothing evil to say. As such, he goes on to say that they'll be ashamed. They'll be embarrassed. They'll be disgraced. Any acquisition that they may make will prove to be groundless. Now, in all essence, this concludes our examination of the first 10 verses of Titus 2. And I know it's taken me a few weeks to be able to get through this, so I want to thank you for allowing me to take the necessary time and explaining it what I think is in a satisfactory manner. You see, like Titus, it's my desire to make sure that this entire teaching in all 10 verses is in accordance with the Word of God, in accordance with sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. It's important. So there's some points of application that we can see that is important for us in these 10 verses. As an overall point of application, all of us who are in Christ Jesus, all of us must make sure that we live in accordance with God's word. It's not the first time you've heard me say this. For those of us who are in Christ, if we, truly, if, we, if we truly desire to live a life that is pleasing to God, if we choose and have a passion to live upright and godly lives in this present age, we have to live a life that is in accordance with God's Word. When you think, That means we have to know God's Word, right? Because you can't follow what you don't know. Please, please take this to heart, because it's so important. I hope this describes you. A second point of application has to do, again, with something that I've addressed over and over again on a number of occasions. Again, for those of us who are desiring to live a life that is pleasing to God, if we want to live an upright life in a godly manner in this present age, then we have to live a life that is balanced. That's balanced. We have to live a life that is self-controlled. And self-control resides in our hearts. It's the ability to curb our desires 
and impulses, especially if they are things that oppose the will of God. This doesn't mean that we're never, ever going to face temptation, although I wish it would. There's temptation all around us. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. And as such, we need to be careful, right? We have to be sensible. We have to be able, when temptation arises, to exercise sound judgment, which means we have to be mastered from within. How are we to master ourselves from within? Through training, through practice, because that's what self-control is all about. And how can we become mastered from within? By living in accordance with God's Word. By knowing it. By live according to it. Because that is pleasing to God. Does that describe you? The third point of application follows the first two. And I had touched on it. Those of us who are in Christ, if we truly desire to live a life that is pleasing to God, if we want to live an upright and godly life in this present age, then again, yeah, we have to be balanced, balanced lives. You cannot be self-control and not be in balance. We have to be balanced in word. We have to be balanced in action. We have to live out what we profess. That means we can't, be, we can't claim to be followers of Jesus and then live like the devil. We cannot proclaim to love Jesus while we hate one another. You can't claim to be a kingdom citizen while you live as those who are citizens of this world, which stands in opposition to the kingdom of God. Can't do that. Your actions and your words must be in balance. We can never, never, never develop the mentality that says, do what I say, but not what I do. On the other hand, actions alone may not be enough. While they may open the door of inquiry, we may need to explain the reasons for why we do what we do. Because our words explain our actions, right? Why are you that way? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> actions support or give credibility to our words. Are you in balance? This leads to a fourth point of application. Living a life that is in accordance to the Word of God in a self-control and balanced manner allows us to be an example that others can follow. In all parts of our life, whether it's our work or our play, our study, our worship, our service, however you want to divide it, we are to be living examples of one who bear the fruit of good works. things that will bring honor and glory to God. Again, let me remind you that if you're in Christ Jesus, you're his workmanship. Let me remind you that you were created to do good works. Let me remind you that this has been a part of God's plan from the beginning. This is what he has prepared in advance that we should do. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' teaching regarding the kingdom of God, he told his followers that we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And notice how Jesus emphasizes the importance of being living examples. In Matthew 5, 16, he said, oh, let me tell you what it says. <laughs> What a bad example I am. <laughs> Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You know why I didn't see? You know what? 
I have that. No, I don't. Oh. Yeah, there it is. Engaging my mouth before my brain acts. I don't... I, I guess I better get in self-control. Brings me to the fifth and final point of application. As you live out your faith, make sure that you do not give an opportunity for someone to be able to make an accusation against your words or deeds, that they are unfit to follow. Don't give them any ammunition. Don't give them an opportunity to say, hey, man, how you're living is an error. Your words and your deeds don't fit. You need to be censored. We are very good, the body of Christ, at providing ammunition for those who oppose us in the body of Christ. We're very good at giving them ammunition. We're always on the news, right? Another one bites the dust. We need to remember that there's always going to people who oppose us. They'll always oppose what we believe if they're not in the kingdom of God. Don't give them ammuni ammunition to make false accusations against you. May the only thing that they can accuse you of is living a self-controlled life that is pleasing to God a life that brings him honor, a life that brings him glory, a self-control, upright, godly life in this present age. Can they accuse you of that? During our time of prayer, I encourage you to keep in mind Nolan and Caroline and pray to this end. People are looking at you. Let your light shine. Let's praise the Spirit leads.
before we're dismissed, we're going to have an opportunity to worship God through song. And we're going to lift up the name of Jesus by our words. And then we'll close in prayer, and then we'll put that into action. You with me? Let's do that together. Sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. said it. Now let's live out the truths that we have just declared. God bless you. You're dismissed. Go live out your faith. <laughs>